heavy, heavy board. agree with that i did as well which honestly like it's weird i feel tossed around by this one yeah fucking tossed around because you know i fucking love bogan like some of my favorite poems ever written by bogan and then there are all those poems that you kind of forget about (sighs) (laughs) between reads and i was like oh yeah not all of these interest me, but as I kept reading, I was like, I became more interested in the poems that didn't originally. Well, uh, I guess we'll get to spark. this. Yeah, I guess we'll get to this later, but I felt similarly in terms of around the fourth section, I texted you about this where like you can, you can feel she's searching for something like she's searching for something. I, I went, I went to this, it's maybe it's a dumb comparison. I was thinking of like, okay, Picasso's blue period, like all these artists, like you reach a point where you're kind of bored with what you were doing, even though she does every, you know, she's fantastic. Everything she did is very well constructed, very tight. She's great. But uh, you do reach a point where, like, okay, now what? Right? Like it's kind of like you're just searching for the okay. And you can kind of see her branching out, you know, like she kind of abandoned me, abandons meter in her career. Not completely, but it's way less frequent than it was in the first couple volumes and all of that and i was just like oh yeah she's searching and i mean i love reaching that point when especially when you're reading like a collected i guess we should uh go into do our introductions before we get into a discussion here i'm already branching off onto something that would be fun to talk about should tell people what disorganized podcast this is uh this is heavy board and i am sophie wiener and i'm andrew Whitstat. Uh, in this week's episode, we're going over uh, Louise Bougan's The Blue Estuaries, her poems, 1923 to 1968. And are these selected, Soph? Did we find that out? Are these selected or? Yeah, I mean, I think essentially they, it, this is like selected and maybe as close as you'll get to um, a collected. But yeah, you. It, I mean, really, it's, you know essentially what five six six sections i think the last one is like uncollected like stuff you know they found in her yeah so these are like the new poems (laughs) or like well i think there there's also you know like um if you go back and it's weird it's so rare i feel like that it's not readily available information like i feel like i had to dig more than usual to figure find out um the titles of her previous collections before this one um i think it's her first that you can just like download for free as a pdf right you know and many of those poems are in here i was surprised when i was like sort of flipping through that to see a few that had been omitted that i thought like oh these are interesting but you know, whatever. But yeah, I, w- I would describe this as a selected. Yeah. And I guess that last and, section is like, it's not posthumous, right? It was just like... No, I mean, this came out when she was alive. And um, she... Um, the, I mean, we should probably also mention that, you know, for a uh, selected, this is really short, right? It's... It ends on page 136. We both have the same copy, I'm assuming. I did have to buy a new one. But, yeah. Yeah, for our Strauss Duro. Yeah. Yeah, it's only you're going to find. It's like, what, 12 bucks on Amazon? Yeah, I don't even think it was. Yeah, I don't even know if it was that much. Yeah, somewhere around there. 
Um, but yeah, really short. So, you know, I mean, you could look at a selected from a lot of other poets who had, you know, equally long careers. It's not like she had some crazy short career as a writer, but I think she was also so much a critic that maybe, you know, she had more of a balance between actually writing poetry and writing prose. Yeah, I've thought about that more recently. I really just in the last couple of days, the last week, where I'm just like, yeah, if you're if you're writing a lot of poetry, well, like that takes a lot of time out of your life. So it's like, you know, if you're doing something like you're a working critic at her level, that takes a lot of time. So even then, you would, I mean, you know, unless you have, I don't know. It's just if you're do, if you're working a whole lot on something, you're not doing something else, right? Like you're not. Yeah, well, and she had a particularly long career um, as the poetry critic at the New Yorker. Yeah, pretty prestigious position. And she was writing, you know, the modern period primarily into the contemporary period. Would you, I don't know that I would, I know that she has been described as a modernist. I'm not convinced that I would describe her that way. I'm I'm not really convinced one way or another. I don't especially care to situate her within a particular movement. Uh, yeah, sometimes that's more limiting, especially when you get ones that don't quite fit any of the movements, uh, you know. Like, what's the, this is always, like, William Carlos Williams, right? Like, people want to call him a modernist because he was right at the same time, but he's not really, like, cons- like I mean, I guess he is, technically, if we're just I mean, going by. he was by. an imagist. Yeah. Which was, like, considered an offshoot of modernism, I guess, but it never made all that much sense to me, except in terms of its preoccupations. Yeah, and I... And, Maybe that's the thing, too, is as we try to frame things in, like, movements and periods, like, it's just a vague reference thing that helps us talk about, like, larger trends in the art, I guess. So, like, you know, take all that with a grain of salt. Like, if they're going to be, oh, well, this person's definitely in this period. It's like, well, you know, it's not like a set rule. Yeah. Well, I that's, I liked her quote. I don't. I couldn't find the source for this quote. I was looking desperately for it. Ooh. I didn't look for it for very long. Um, but her quote on retiring as the New Yorker critic. Um, what what was it? No more trying not to be a square or to appear a square. <laughs> yeah, no more struggling not to be a square was the end of the... The whole thing is no more pronouncements on lousy verse, no more hidden competition, no more struggling not to be a square. <laughs> and it was the last one that I thought was sort of funny, yeah. you know. <laughs> like, you know, was she? would she have thought herself as being sort of like an uncool poet? Well, that's a strange, that's an interesting question because there is that level. We've talked about this a little bit with, in terms of fiction, some of the fiction books we've talked about with like the literary versus pop kind of styles. What are the rules? What makes, what's the cutoff, right? Who blurs that line? How well do you blur that line? And it's like, we don't think about that often for poetry, but the same thing exists, right? Like there's like the New Yorker and then there's, you know, the street, street what some people call it street poetry right or like you know uh yeah well and even then you know some of the like cool kid poets would have become very highly regarded later on well, at that time happens. but poetry was much far well but there was still like it was it s- seems i mean you know there was more uh a literary center to the culture overall, maybe. Yeah, I just think it might have something more to say. I mean, I don't know what it's saying exactly, but I could theorize that it's like, okay, once things get to a high-minded level, so we talk, let's, I guess for just for 
talking about this will say like okay academia is like the high-minded highbrow whatever you want to call it uh academic way of looking at poetry and fiction you could say that too but it's like that and then there's like there's always been but i think more so in the 20th century right there was like this kind of just because more people could read printing things was cheaper all that kind of stuff right so we could get kind of like again i hate to use this term but i say street poets like just kind of people that weren't in the ivory tower that were on the outside of it and they're always the ones that push the boundary so it's like okay then they get accepted as 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 part of a movement or part of like an academic study and then you know the cycle continues kind of thing and then new kind of what we would call street poets or non-academically kind of thing poets come and it's well i think you know even if you look at like the traditional versus the experimental i think is also i mean i would assume that you know during that time there was probably still plenty of like high modern influence interest in you know that's a lot of the experimentation that was born out of that yeah but yeah i don't know i i wonder uh what she meant by no more struggling not to be a square <laughs> Well, because the reason I was saying that is because there is what we would call kind of like an artistic, almost like cliche that we would put on the street side. And again, that's my, I don't know if really if there's a different term for that or a better term for that. Yeah, are well, considered like the, the more, or, well, like they're the, 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 the real artists living on the street, you know, starving for their art. Like, yeah, well, I think that is it. Like the starving artist, maybe. Well, that compared to somebody who was employed as the New Yorker poetry critic for like forty years, yeah. uh, making six figures. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know if she was back then, but they probably definitely are now. You just mean like of the institution versus right. not? Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's I mean. So the institution is mainly kind of academia, and then like the New Yorker things that kind of flutter around academia but i mean there is a divide yeah. right like if we're being honest like there is two levels to this and i mean it does run in circles and usually i would say I'll, i guess i'll make this statement where it's like yeah it usually follows whatever the boundaries that are being pushed on the kind of street level as i keep calling it again i don't know what else to kind of call the, non the street you gotta stop calling it the street <laughs> Street poets. Stop fucking uh, calling it that. Street poets, dude. What should we call it? Like I said, I don't know. Non-academic. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. The non-ivory tower. Right. Just in the ivory tower versus not. And the like, I mean, but a lot of poets who were not of the ivory tower still you know became a part of it but even then i mean you know if you would characterize like i mean i yeah i think it's just academic versus not in terms of not in terms of like the quality of the work but um the environment in which right. that they're born out of which is going to have different like tastes and sensibilities and all of that stuff. Right. I want to be... 15 to... minutes in it. I'm talking about street poetry. <laughs> well, just like, yeah, well, there are cool kids and then there are squares, right? Yeah, I think that's... I mean, well, in cool kid clubs, you know, we have those in literature. Yeah, I'm saying that's those... Sure. I'm saying those are the ones that push the boundary forward and then the cycle goes on. So, like, the tower then consumes those and brings them up to the tower level, right? Just like accepts them as part yeah. of it. And then, you know, the cycle continues. So then a new group of people that aren't in that kind of tower, ivory tower circle, then push the boundaries again. And then the, all that kind of stuff, like it just keeps happening, particularly like in the 20th century here. Yeah. I, what did you, I also, you know, for someone who is so concerned with, you know, their struggle to, you know, not be square, I guess. 
Uh, and I don't know if that, that, I mean, that could apply to her work as a reviewer probably a bit more, but pro- I assume equally to her work as a poet just because I assume that her taste as a critic was informed by her own taste as a poet or vice versa, whatever. It doesn't matter. Right. I don't really care about that. But, you know, I thought that there was a good bit of range in terms of style which I think is really pleasant and like refreshing, especially when, you know, I think that, you know, there are definitely a lot of contemporary books that show a range of style. Like there are those, but I think there is also a much larger trend of like having a single form that you're working in or having a particular style or like a, a theme that is, so defined from the outset of the project that it is like the book is the project you know it with it, it's treated in many ways like a narrative or um like a single work so you know this is not the kind of collection that you would see um even if this weren't a selected you know I feel like you wouldn't find this kind of collection quite as easily. Maybe you would. Maybe I'm just not reading the right ones. I don't know. I mean, that's more getting to like the publishing stuff. So they're only going to publish. I mean, some nonprofit publishers w- w- care about preserving the text. So they'll publish like a complete just for like preservation's sake. But then most of the time those don't sell, you know? So, I mean, why would a, you know, the incentive just isn't there for a publisher to care so much. Yeah, but I just mean in terms of, I just mean in terms of how people choose to construct their collections. Uh, I mean, like the poets individually, like how they are constructed around a particular story or theme or idea or whatever it is. And like, that's often true. And that often ends up being true. You know, even if you don't set out with a particular one in mind, because poets have their own obsessions and those tend to stick around for a little bit. Um, Entire careers for some, yeah. Yeah, Uh, so those tend to come together, I think, anyway, but I think also... Or at least what a lot of what I I felt like I was seeing as a graduate student, that's not always true. I mean, you see poets even like, you know, like I wouldn't characterize most of A. Limon's books as being, um, you know, hell bent on having a particular narrative that carries through or like having a specific character or um, some, you know, just some kind of arc that well if we're talking about Lamone, i mean the only thing would be her first book you know this big fake world that kind of has like a narrative yeah. through yeah that's what i mean so i yeah i mean you see books like this do well but not always and you know they might have something that links them stylistically like really specifically like a particular form or um a particular you know whether that form is already you know a traditional received form or if it is one that was just sort of created. But yeah, I appreciated the range that was presented here in terms of formal versus grievers or, um, you know, or just uh, the way that like she'll have like lyric strangeness. Versus like high and tight kind of logical poems, you know, like the difference between like um, a tale, which is the first poem in the collection, or like some of the shorter poems that are often accompanied by like a tight formal quality. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, that's the benefit. I always say this when we said that we did Keats and all that, like this, the benefit of reading a whole bodies of work as a student of this, you know, student of literature, student of poetry, whatever, student of the craft of writing, it's like, you really do get to see 
how broad some of the range is for some. And then in the cases like Keats, granted, we didn't have much because he died so young, right? We kind of said, well, the range wasn't as broad because we only got like, you know, 15 years of his life and we got 50 years of Bogan here to kind of see. Much, much less of her. Yeah, well, yeah, less, but uh, I mean, honestly, the Keats one should have been this length anyway. Like, I guess longer for like some of his big epics, but... Yeah, we all feel that way about many collections of poetry. Yeah. There are very few that are quite so long that I think deserve to be. Uh, she reminds me, Bogan reminds me of Marianne Moore a little bit, really? but with better line breaks. I haven't read much Marianne Moore. Oh, yeah. Her line breaks will piss you off. Probably. <laughs> the most do. I know. But, yeah... Uh, my thoughts are just, yeah, these are very well constructed. I guess she doesn't use a whole lot of receive form unless you count the sonnet, but she uses, um, very... she uses, well, she uses a lot of like regular, um, rhyme schemes. Yeah. She uses and rhyme schemes a and good bit of meter. Yeah. I would say particularly the first three sections, almost every poem is metered, uh, you know, like clear, and crisp stanzas. Yeah, that's right. my, my first note. And all of this was just like very tight and well constructed. Nothing's out of place. Uh, everything's purposeful. The meter's perfect. Uh, consistently, like throughout. Uh, but then, yeah, I guess we'll get to this. So we talked about it a little already. Yeah, and then you get to see the kind of growth. What the, like, those later sections, she's, I think you can really tell she's looking for something she's trying to push the boundaries uh if not just of her own work but just like yeah like maybe the genre in general the craft all of that and that's when you do see her going away from some of that meter but yeah overall i mean this is the second time i've read this book uh i have very little bad to say about bogan and at the same time, I'm not a huge fan. So I guess it's just all down to taste for me at that point. But like I said, I have very little negative to say. So I don't know what that says about me or the book. Yeah, that actually surprises me because I feel like there's a lot of... I mean, there are moments where I feel like these poems are smarter than me. Really? Where I feel like I still have to really sit with them for a while. But there, I mean, uh, I really like Bogan in part for that reason. It has that same quality of Emily Dickinson where you have to go back and reread and it uncovers something new. Um, and it feels like you can go endlessly into the same poem, you know? but without feeling entirely off the rails. There are those for me that feel a little bit too ungrounded, but you know, even um, like one that was sort of new to me in terms of how it stuck with me was Zone. And that's a later poem on 109. Way back there. Yeah. What section is this? Um, isn't it the last? Five. Yeah, I think so. Section six it's is like, like... It's five, yeah. yeah. It's toward the beginning of... It's toward... Yeah, I guess it's... Five is pretty short. It's the pretty segments, short they actually... The sections actually get shorter. Yeah. As you progress through, yeah. What we'll keep going, what were going to say about soon? Yeah, I was curious. I mean, this was one of those poems where I was sort of stuck on it. I mean, this is really the part of the book where she seems like there are a lot of themes of like death and aging. Um, permanence is a theme, I feel like, all the way through. But I feel like death really starts to come into the game in sections maybe four and five or of aging at minimum. But yeah, I was like sort of just struggling with this poem a little bit, I guess. Um, but then it also struck me that I read, when I, every time I read it, I keep taking those first two lines of the second stanza as humorous. 
like a ship we have struck expected latitudes of the universe in March. March capitalized implying the month. Yeah. But then also, again, this is her brilliance, so it's used in that way, but it's also about like, okay, you could think it of actually physically marching, like the verb. Yeah. So it could be used both ways, but clearly the capital means the month, but yeah, I mean, that's just her brilliance. Yeah. I read expected latitudes in March. That was funny. I don't know if that's to be like end of winter. Because there's also like a lot of reference to season and time of day, I think, and you know, as, as is commonly, you know, done to refer to like time of one's life, whatever. We pass thinking, now we hear what we heard last year and bear the wind's rude touch and its ugly sound equally with so much we have learned how to bear. Yeah. Thinking, now we hear what we heard last year and bear the wind's rude touch and its ugly sound equally with so much we have learned how to bear. Yeah, man. And then her, like, structure with that. What did you ask? Yeah, I'm just like, that was one that I didn't read a ton of times and was still sort of thinking through. But I was reading this as a death poem, but I couldn't square that with the title, which is Zone. I will say that her titles uh, could be doing more work in some places. Again, it's one of the few negative things I have to say. But yeah, Zone. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, so that's like one of my favorites that I'm still working with, or that's a new favorite. I mean, old favorites, I would say Division is up there. That's an earlier poem. Knowledge is great. The Alchemist. Um, Man Alone is great. And I think March Twilight might be my favorite. And then Night. Night is the title poem for this book. That's where the title comes from. The blue estuaries. Well, you just want to go section by section? Yeah. What was I the first I think we thing? should do at least one from each. Yeah. What was the first one you marked? Mine was The Frightened um, Man on page six. Mine will... Well, so, like, I, I always think it's interesting that Medusa is one of her most favorite ones. And, like, I feel like, you know, if you want to, you can always go look at someone else read that. Because it's one of the most famous ones, and it's, like, the second in the book. But my first one is always the first one in the book. A tale. Okay. Because it's interesting to see that early one. And again, it's, like, one of those that's, like, more ambiguous. So do you want to just do, like, one each per section or something? Or just one per section? Uh, it doesn't matter. I had a few. I think there was a section where I didn't mark any poems. Yeah. Section two? Yeah, I think so. I think section two was the one that just didn't do it for me. Let me check the... I don't think I have any. Well, that's not true. I have one. Come, break with time. Page yeah, that's a good one. So that was the one I had in section two. And then there were a few lines that I had underlined in section two, but not entire poems. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> well, let's each do one then, or we'll just alternate. Do you want to talk about a tale? Yeah, I mean, this is like one of those weird, I mean, it sets itself up as a narrative of some kind. All right, this youth too long has heard the break of waters in a land of change. He goes to see what sons can make from soil more indirect and strange. Yeah, I mean, I think this is like a weird one because there's so much where... Uh, not that commonly are we given that many characters. There, They are there. But there's a lot of you and a lot of we. So maybe, I mean, this one I think stands out in that regard. But there are moments of just... Um, like you can see the nuggets 
of, of like time of concerns with time and nature and permanence. He cuts what holds his days together and shuts him in as lock on lock. The arrowed vein announcing weather, the tripping racket of a clock. So, again, nature, time. Seeking, I think, a light that waves <coughs> still as a lamp upon a shelf. So, again, a, a light that waits, a light that's permanent. Where no sea leaps upon itself, like waves, so like something still. But he will find that nothing dares to be more enduring, save where south of hidden deserts, torn fire glares on beauty with a rusted mouth. Where something dreadful and another look quietly upon each other. I mean, like, that's just fucking great. <laughs> yeah. There's, like, such a quality of strangeness in this one that I think you see throughout this whole collection. Um... But maybe not in such a sort of fantastical feeling way. Like, not as quite as otherworldly seeming as this poem. So in that, it just sort of stood out as a little bit different to me. Yeah, and I guess this, is, again, is about the loss or about the discovery of um, youth realizing the awful awfulness of the world, right? Or maybe we could argue youthfulness coming to of age understanding right seeking i think a light like, as yes. that waits still as a lamp upon a shelf right so something that doesn't exist uh a land with hills like rocky gates where no sea leaps upon itself right so something that doesn't exist but he will find that nothing dares something unchanging yeah well yeah exactly right right coming to terms of the fact that yeah we have little control we have little idea where something dreadful and another look quietly upon each other i mean yeah right kind of coming to terms with this right yeah torn fire glares on beauty with a rusted mouth yeah comma then m dash yeah some of the punctuation at first i thought the m dash was a note that i had started to make and then i was like nope that's really there yeah. But there were a couple of places that I was like concerned with the comma usage. Like where she's clearly using it for pause, but not where it's necessary. And so like it, it almost hindered the reading for me, but whatever. I mean the poem was other the poems were otherwise still good. I would have to look to figure out which one. Well I guess in this one specifically a tale, the way it's used for listeners uh, there are two instances in the third and fourth stanza where uh, it's a comma and then an M dash. So it's kind of, you could argue, I guess that's redundant, but technically, I mean, it's grammatically correct. If you're using the two, uh, it's not like it's wrong. It's just, okay. And I don't know if this is just because, you know, this was kind of uh, written in the twenties, <laughs> like, you know, like we were, I mean, we always talk about this, but yeah, I mean, language is ever evolving, right? That's kind of a cliche by now. We know most people, you should understand this if you're a reader, lover of books and writing, etc. But yeah, so it could just be like, um, we didn't know quite how to use the M dash just yet uh, to our advantage as much. But I mean, it is working in terms of like, it's using to change subjects like it would in a sentence. You could argue the comma does the same thing, I think, but... Uh, or even to extend a pause. Right, that's what I mean. So it's using the break and a comma and an M dash. Because they're both at the end of the line. But... So that first instance, yeah. Seeking, I think, a light that waits. Still as a lamp upon a shelf. Comma, M dash. A land with hills like rocky gates. Where no sea leaps upon itself. So it is kind of like an extended pause but we're also changing so she's given us an example and then another example it's kind of used the same way in the in the in the uh, penultimate stanza there so that fourth stanza as well and then you could probably hear the rhyme scheme listeners i mean she's just a very articulate very rigid rhyme scheme that works on almost on pretty much every level i would say like i said I have very little structurally there was very little i could say negatively about this i think it's she's a structural 
stickler maybe just you know perfectionist and it shows like you can yeah, see I mean, it. if you look at pictures of bogan she looks like a fucking stickler dude uh yeah we have i guess we're gonna get into her uh banging roth key uh yeah. but uh well, i guess we'll imagine, save, uh, imagine what she looked like taking a shit uh, <laughs> i wonder what her shits were like yeah i couldn't I find how those were i couldn't find like a picture of her that when she was young i could only find like middle-aged and older bogan i couldn't find like young 2030s uh bogan pictures yeah i'll work on that yeah but yeah Yeah, but she uses the same punctuation again, the frightened man. Yeah, yeah, that was the first one I marked. That was same thing in only one instance of that, but yeah. And I didn't I, I guess I should have paid closer attention to this. I guess we'll the ones when we go through the sections we'll notice, see if she keeps using that. Ha, I already saw one. In division. Where the, the comma disappears and the M dash is used more like contemporarily. But then the poem right next to that in Cassandra on page 33, she's doing it the same way with a comma than M dash. So it might just be a stylistic thing. I'm not well read enough in this time period, uh, as much as it embarrasses me to admit. And even, yeah, on page 8, she also has the uh, just the M dash without a comma. So I guess it's purposely there. It's deliberate then. I mean, I guess, we, you know, we should always assume that, but yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, The Frightened Man on page six. That was the first one I marked that just stood out to me. And I guess I should say, uh, okay. So Sefi just sent me a picture of young Bogan. Uh, she was kind of hot. Yeah, I was going to say very, very classic. Classic beauty, those pearls. She's always fucking wearing pearls yeah. in all the pictures. Yeah. Strong jaw and chin, all that. Yeah. Yeah. She was a hottie. Uh, I don't even know what Rocky looked like. Was he ugly? Was he like a butt ugly? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. All right, we'll get to that. Yeah, the frightened man. Uh, in fear of the rich mouth, I kissed the thin. Even that was a trap to snare me in. Even she, so long, the frail, the scentless, it became strong and proves relentless. Oh, forget her praise and how I sought her through a hazardous maze by shafted water. Yeah. Fucking great. In the fear of the rich mouth, I kissed the thin. Comma M dash. This is page six for listeners. Yeah. Yeah, just fucking great. <laughs> the frightened man. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of romance and passion and like romantic betrayal. Such is life. But yeah, I mean, and we think that we go from that. So this is one where I think the title's doing a lot of work. It's giving us the entire setup, right? Like. The Frightened Man. And then we just get three little tiny stanzas here, all perfectly, uh, you know, um, rhymed and metered through. Oh, forget her praise and how I sought her <laughs> through a hazardous maze by shafted water. Yeah. That's, a, yeah, again, like, sh funny. A little sarcasm. And in this one with the M dash, a, a little bitchy. Yeah, but it's also I very, like, it's which also, I enjoy. also very accurate. She's kind of describing like the 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 fear that men have, particularly young men, of women, right? Mm. But yeah, Rothke yeah. was not a looker. So if he just sent a photo, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the most attractive picture I can find. Yeah, he was a chunky baldy. Like that's. Uh, like, so I'm questioning how accurate that one is. <laughs> we have to give everybody their fair share, dude. You got to look at them when most people are yeah. in their prime. If that's the best we got, it's the best we got. Man. I guess most poets are not known for being good looking. I mean, Yeah, some were. Some, yeah. Not this guy. Yeah, I guess I don't have much to say about it. Like I guess I have very little negative to say. 
Oof, that's old Rothke. Yeah. God damn, Sophie's not old Rothke. Yeah. He looks like shit. Yeah. Oof. And I don't have much more to say about it, just that, yeah, I think it does. This one where the title, everything works. This was the first one I saw. I was like, all right, page six, everything works. There's no... Yeah, I think there are actually a lot of poems like that early on. <coughs> They're like these tight little... These tight little cuties, you know? Yeah. Like one song. When beauty breaks and falls asunder, I feel no grief for it, but wonder... When love, like a frail shell, lies broken, I keep no chip of it for token. I never had a man for friend who did not know that love must end. I never had a girl for lover who could discern when love was over. What the, wi what the wise doubt the fool believes, who is it then that love deceives? Wan Song. Is there significance to that name? Significance to no, that? Not that I could figure out, no. Yeah. I wonder if it's just somebody Although she was... It's, uh, a, yeah, it might just be for somebody. She was bad. Or, I, yeah, or maybe it's... I don't know, because it's a male name. Yeah, it could just be a random I, like yeah. I, yeah. It makes me think, though, that the speaker then is... that it, Like, the speaker could be just, like, intended to be this one... Like some kind of Don Juan. Okay, yeah, so the play on that. Yeah, okay, I didn't even think about that. Right. Again, man, like I said, I have very little negative to say. Uh, but then I, I, I just, I don't know. I think I just don't like poetry right now. I'm going through a moment. Yeah. <laughs> we know you don't like poetry right now yeah. I mean I just like the logic of this poem you know I'm always drawn to that with the wise doubt the fool believes who is it then that love deceives men can tell that love must end so why enter it at all and women never know when love is over and thus are I guess fooled by it it's an interesting theme too. This kind of dynamic, specifically of love between men and women. Uh, I guess it's a reoccurring theme that comes up in a lot of her work. I mean, you know, it's is very. I mean, this is the human dance, right? Like, love is the ultimate kind of thing that you have to deal with in life, or that gives us some type of fulfillment or whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, even in the next poem over on the next page <laughs> you know I, I, we don't have to read the whole thing but just to give a sense it's called portrait and it ends with the lines um, what she has gathered and what lost she will not find to lose again she is possessed by time who once was loved by men <sighs> So there's also, you know, uh, like certainly a concern with um, beauty here, with one's own beauty and desirability. Aging. Yeah. Possessed by time. Who once was loved by men. Yeah. All that. Portrait. Page 11. Uh, the other ones I marked in the first section... The Alchemist was one I liked. Another short little simple one. Very simple rhyme yeah, scheme. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, very simple rhyme scheme as well. Memory was the other one, page 18. And I think that might be all that I did in section one that I marked. Yeah, that one I marked. I marked memory too just because of her use of like words like stuff and things. Right. Yeah. <laughs> which seems so like... I don't know. It had seemed uncharacteristic to me. Do you want to do memory real quick before we move? Do not guard this this as rich stuff without mark closed in a cedarn dark, nor lay it down with tragic masks and greaves licked by the tongues of leaves. 
nor let it be as eggs under wings of helpless, startled things, nor encompassed by song, nor any glory, perverse and transitory. Rather, like shards and straw upon coarse ground, of little worth when found, rubble and gardens, it and stones alike, that any spade may strike. Yeah. Kind of the uselessness of memory, the banality. Yeah. Do not regard this as rich stuff without mark. Yeah. <laughs> the very first line of the poem is called Memory. Yeah. Nor let it be as eggs under the wings of helpless, startled things. Yeah, like, don't protect them. I mean, yeah, it. she's, again, there's that, like, little bit of bitchiness that's always really enjoyable, especially in poems of such that, it, you know, um, really are quite logical. But, yeah, I would say the first... This first um, section is marked by a bit of bitchiness that I really enjoy. And it, that continues, I would say, but um, a little bit less regularly. Memories just rubble in gardens, it and stones alike, that any spade may strike. Yeah. Fucking bogan. Was there anything else in section one before we move on? No, I don't think we should linger there for too long. Yeah. What did you want to cover in section two? Because I think I only marked a couple things. Yeah, this one, I actually, I really like this section a lot more than you, I guess. they are the ones that I marked. My favorite one from this section is Division. But that's an old favorite. But I also love, wait, this might be part three. Hang on, I gotta check. I also love I Saw Eternity. That was one I didn't like. Really? Here's yeah. a crumb of forever. <laughs> yeah. I underlined that oh, last man. line. This felt, yeah. this felt very... I don't know. There was something about the ending that felt very Dickinson to me. Yeah. I... The note I put here, I underline the last line. Yeah, it's just a good line. Here's a crumb of forever. Here's bright everlasting. Here's a crumb of forever. That's great. It's like good line, but the, I just thought there just wasn't enough here. But, yeah. yeah, I'll I'll buy that. I think it's a fun poem. I might agree that there's not a lot there. But yeah, there's some great um, stuff. That's also right before Come Break with Time. Yeah, that was my favorite in this section. Come break with time, page 51. Really? You didn't like Division? I wasn't, a, I didn't mark it, but. I think that's one of the best sounding poems in the book. Long days and changing weather put the shadow upon the door. Up from the ground, the duplicate tree. Oh, wow. There's a fucking enjambment I forgot about. The duplicate tree reflected in shadow, out from the hole, the single mirrored against the single. The tree and the hour and the shadow no longer mingle, fly free that burn together. Replica turned to yourself upon thinnest color and air, woven in changeless leaves. The burden of the scene is clasped against the eye, though assailed and undone is the green. Upon the wall and sky, time and the tree stand there. Yeah. A lot of concern with shadow, which only becomes more pronounced as we go on, I think. But again, this was like one of those poems that relies on a lot of logic that I really enjoyed, just in terms of how an image or how a shadow works, you know? Right. And again, concerned with permanence and possibly aging. Though assailed and undone is the green upon the wall and sky, time and the trees stand there. Yeah, I just was, I don't know, I guess it, it just didn't, like I said, I, have, I don't have much negative to say except that uh, I am 
I mean, it's about a shadow. Like, <laughs> it's about a tree well, shadow. Well, maybe it pairs well. Yeah, I don't think it's just like about a tree shadow. I think it's really in those last. The tree and the hour and the shadow no longer mingle. Right? Yeah. The burden of the scene is clasped against the eye. We see. <laughs> like, right. like, you know, like we can see the dying. Oh, the tree's dying? Not just the shadow. No, uh, not necessarily. I interpreted this Though as... Though assailed and undone as the green. I interpreted not this as like the trick of the eye, so that you see the tree and then you see the shadow of the tree. So it's replica, it's reflection, right? It's mingling on the walls and the door and the changing weather that changes it. And you see the two separate, right? Yeah. That's what I mean. So the division between what we see and then like the shadows cast from what we see that changes. At least that's how I read it. So it, or maybe what it's actually saying is it allows us to see. Well, I don't fucking know. <laughs> that's what I mean, yeah, it's like it's about a shadow, fucking right? Fucking like... no, dude. Time and the tree stand there. What yeah. is the burden of the scene? The Woven tree and the hour. Yeah. The tree and the hour and the shadow no longer mingle. Fly free that burn together. Or maybe it's about a certain point in time when there is no shadows, right? When the sun's highest, it's directly above. Creates little shadow. What was the other one you said? Oh, uh, the one that you had mentioned. Come break with time. Yeah. Come break with time. You who are lorded by a clock's chime, so ill afforded. If time is allayed, be not afraid. I shall break if I will. Break since you must. Time has its fill, sated with dust. Long the clock's hand burned like a brand. Take the rock's speed and earth's heavy measure. Let the buried seed drain out time's pleasure. Take time's decrees. Come cool ease. Yeah, it's a good one. Again, perfectly tight. Yeah, I like this one. It's not... It's good. I have nothing, like, really bad to say about it. Again. Yeah, and I'm trying to separate in my head if I'm just bored with some of the instances, some of the points being made, or some of the larger things that are trying to be said. If not, maybe this was more impactful in, I guess, the 30s or whatever when it was published. And we hadn't been, like, I hadn't been filled with this kind of, you know, like the Ginsburg throw your throw your time pieces off of buildings, right? Like, kind of. And then, you know, break with time. Time controlling you. You know enjoy the leisure times all that kind of stuff don't worry about the clock strikes the chimes drain out time's pleasure take time's decrees come cruel ease yeah i read this as another death poem yeah what do you think that i mean how else do you read come cruel ease take time's decrees come cruel ease yeah, I mean, you I know... Every cruel ease is death. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It could be death. I shall break if I will. Break, since you must. With time, right? Time has its fill. Sated with dust. Death poems. Yeah, I mean, I guess... I read a lot of them as death poems, because I don't know how else to read them. <laughs> Could be. And again, I like I said, you know, she's almost like she's one of those poem poets I read as like very smart. What do you mean? Like you can't 
And that's not to say there aren't really smart poets who write relatively simpler poems, but I think her poems are complicated. I mean, like, structure-wise, depth? Mm. Depth, content. Yeah. Mostly. Language. Uh, themes and symbolism. Break with time. See an eternity. Yeah, a lot of concern with time. Like, very... Like, in very broad ways. Like, time, capital T, time. The only other thing I had underlined was one line from that uh, Summer Wish poem. Probably her longest poem. Yeah. In this collection. One of the longest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say probably. That line on page 57 at the top. Clawed up the bone of phrase with the black conflict. Clawed up the bone of phrase with the black conflict. I was like, oh yeah. Underline that line. <laughs> so, yeah. anything else you wanted to hit in section two? Um, no. Uh, section three. I had a couple in this. Exhortation was the first one. I actually did double stars on that. The Sleeping Fury. Uh, that was it. You like exhortation because it says bastard in the first line. Uh, I don't know. No, nah, there are some good lines here. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> Give over seeking bastard joy, nor cast for fortune's sidelong look. Indifference can be your toy. The yeah. bitter heart can be your book. Its lesson torment never shook. Its lesson torment never shook. Yeah. I guess it's another one about heartbreak. Yeah, I mean... Um, <laughs> well, like, there's the returning theme of passion. Read how, through though passion sets in storm and grief so comfort, and the young touch at the flint when it's warm. It is the dead we live among, the dead given motion and a tongue. The dead long trained to cruel sport and, <laughs> and the crude gossip of the grave. The dead who pass in motley sort, whom sun nor sufferance can save. Face them, they sneer, do not be brave. No once for all their snare is set, even now be sure their trap is laid. And you will see your lifetime yet come to their terms your plans unmade and be belied and be betrayed. Yeah. No once for all their snare is set. Even now be sure their trap is laid and be betrayed. Exhortation. Give over seeking bastard joy nor cast for fortune sidelong <laughs> look. Yeah. Indifference can be your toy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's great. The bitter heart can be your book. Yeah, it's all about the sort of, I mean, she's very broody. Though not necessarily in tone, but like in, in sort of what she talks about. She's like, a, kind of like a broody ass bitch. It's nice. Yeah, I enjoy it. This is a really good one. I'm glad you pulled it out. Because yeah, I didn't be my, really linger on this one. It might be my favorite. I put two stars just to like indicate to myself that this one was really good. Do not be brave. Yeah, I'm like surprised by those really short sentences right there. That's like three super short sentences making up one line, which... I think we very rarely see in this book. Right. Yeah. Well, it's the whole thing. So the dead, long trained to cruel sport, and the crude gossip of the grave, the dead who pass in motley sort, whom sun nor sufferance can save. 
face them. They sneer. Do not be brave. God, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. So I wonder if she's like if she the dead in this is maybe not necessarily dead people, but yeah, those not passionate. Those. I I think I read it more literally. But yeah, maybe you're, maybe you're right. Yeah, or just like the dead and so yeah, the worthlessness of plans. Give over seeking bastard joy. Yeah. I didn't do enough um research on hypocrite swift. What's that? Um that's another famous one. Oh, poem. That's written in res- yeah. But um what oh, other no, ones the only other one I marked here was the Sleeping Fury. Yeah, I think I marked that one too. You didn't mark um also marked henceforth from the mind. Yeah, the Sleeping Fury was another one that surprised me. Yeah, the Sleeping Fury was good. And this is one of the few times where she has this divergence of um, rhyme. Even divergence from, like, set stanzas. So you alternate between, like, this kind of four, five, three-line stanzas. Much longer lines. Do you think this is about Rothke? (laughs) Page 78. You are here now. Who wear so loud and feared in a symbol before me, alone and asleep, and I at last look long upon you. And then basically goes to this description of sleeping, so your hair fallen on your cheek, no longer in the semblance yeah, of serpents. I... Yeah. I saw, I assumed this more as a portrait just because it says, you, my scourge, my sister, lie asleep like a child who after rage for an hour quiet sleeps out its tears. Yeah, I took this one to be about the passions. What passions? You know, the passions, broadly. But I guess specifically rage. Yeah. Yeah, and it's one of her longer ones, although still not super long. She doesn't really write long stuff. She uses the word scourge so much in this poem. One. Two. Three. Just three. But I mean, that's still kind of a lot. Yeah. Oh, no. Four. Two in one sentence. Dropping the scourge when at last the scourged advances to meet it. You, when the hunted turns, no longer remain the hunter. Alone and strong in my peace, I look upon you and yours. Yeah. We had comparison to uh, Medusa here, no longer in the semblance of serpents. Right? Your hair falling on your cheek, no longer in the semblance of serpents. Lifted in the gale, your mouth that shrieked so, silent. Yeah. The sleeping fury... And now I may look upon you, having once met your eyes. You lie and sleep and forget me. Alone and strong in my peace, I look upon you and yours. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I took. I guess I take that more straightforwardly as being about rage. The sleeping fury. Or the experience, the experience after rage. Yeah. Is there anything else in section three? Man Alone, I think, is great. Yeah, we have a lot of rage in this section. Mm -hmm. It is yourself you seek. In a long rage, scanning through light and darkness, mirrors the page. Where should reflected be those eyes and that thick hair, that passionate look, that laughter? You should appear... Within the book, or doubled, freed in the silvered glass, 
into all bo other bodies yourself should pass. The glass does not dissolve. Like walls, the mirrors stand. The printed page gives back words by another hand. And your infatuate eye meets not itself below. Strangers lie in your arms as I lie now. Yeah. I think this one's about Rothke. <sighs> mm -mm. Not, not especially. I think this is about like human vanity and also probably her own desire to find like I mean this is one that you know you secretly read as the experience of the poet writing it you know it is yourself you seek yeah in a long rage scanning through light and darkness mirrors the page or should reflected be those eyes and that thick hair? <laughs> I think it's literally about seeing, trying to see yourself in everything you read. Strangers lie in your arms, as I lie now. Yeah. It's clever as fuck. Yeah. Like I said, I don't have much to say. Yeah. I can make this a short one. I'm gonna skip to like. I mean, we can sort of condense the last ones. Well, section four we already talked. is the it's section. Super fucking. Yeah, it's short, but it's also the one that I think is so drastic. It varies so widely from her previous stuff. In which ways? Like, how would you describe it? As, I mean, there's so many short poems. That there's are there very far short, like crazy short, like I, super short. The one in this one was questions in a question in a field was the one that I marked, and there's only a few poems in this fourth section here. This one gets bitchy. Yeah. <laughs> Several voices out of a cloud, too. I mean, that's the first one of the section. But yeah, which one? Uh, question in a Field, page 97. Yeah. Pasture, stone wall, and steeple. What most perturbs the mind, the heart-rending homely people, or the horrible beautiful kind. <laughs> horrible beautiful kind. Yeah. And it's like, this, this is so different from everything else she's done. Where we have this single sentence making up the entire poem. It's only four lines long, a single stanza. And I mean... Even that, you said several voices out of a cloud. That's only two little stanzas, two sentences, three, total, four, I guess, four sentences. And it's just the two stanzas. And I just thought, that, like, you know, the rhyme is there in some of these. I don't know. I just thought she moved further away from what she was normally doing. Yeah. And I wonder if this is that period where she was heavily influenced by modernist stuff. Uh,. There's a lot of epigraphs in this for the poems, uh, referencing works of art. Uh, there's variations on a sentence, references to Rose Journal for an epigram. Yeah, I always enjoy variation on a sentence. <laughs> I mean, it's just sort of straightforward. Of white and tawny, black as ink, yellow and undefined, and pink, and piebald. There are doves, I think. And that's what I mean. It's Both kind and her. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I think in this section we can see her kind of getting to that point where she's reaching for something. Like she's trying to do mm. something other than like a typical what you would expect in a poem. She's looking, experimenting with these short things. And not just that, that one poem that's literally two lines, solitary observation brought back from a sojourn in hell. It's very minimalist. It's a joke. I mean. Yeah. Like, that's a joke of a poem. Uh, the crazy short one? Yeah, solitary observation brought back. Yeah. Home. Yeah, at midnight tears run into your ears. My only note on that is yep. just garbage. 
Yeah, it just doesn't need to be there. Yeah, I don't like any of that. I think it's just... I mean, no doubt, like I said, no doubt she was searching for something. I mean, the limits, what can be pushed, what can be changed, what can be expanded. What are the boundaries of calling a poem a poem? Everybody refers to that Ezra Pound poem, which is also garbage. But I also don't think that poem would have ever been published on its own. I think it serves as like a kind of step away or a breath, you know, a break. Uh or I think those tend to, at least, or they should. I think they're rarely ever things that get published standalone in a journal or something. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean... Yeah, I when just... during all this was she fucking Rithke? I wonder. Yeah. I don't know. It's just that annoyed me. Always annoys me. Was there anything in section four you thought? Because then in section five we do seem uh, to go even further. I think she keeps continuing on that trend with these shorter poems, variations. Uh, she has longer lines. Was there anything in section five or four? Um, five. Where is it? Six, I think, is where I have the most notes. Maybe because that's where the title poem is. Um, I, I mean, I largely like this section. Again, I talked about zone already. Like a ship, we have struck expected latitudes of the universe in March. But yeah, I think that's the only one I've really marked as being one that especially wowed me. I think Evening in the Sanitarium is interesting. Another sort of longer departure from the brief poems. Yeah, there were a few lines in that Evening in the Sanitarium that I liked. And that one was, was the subtitle was removed where they said it was imitated from Auden. Yeah. The yeah, so a lot of playfulness here. Um, is this the section where we have the demon? Must I tell again in the words I know for the ears of men, the flesh, the blow? Must I show outright the bruise in the side, the halt in the night, and how death cried? Must I speak to the lot who little bore? It said, why not? It said once more. I mean, I think that's just about writing. Or is that the beginning? Is that? Yeah, no, that's toward the end of section five. Yeah. Yeah, song for the last act is one we hear a lot of. I have no great desire to read it right now. No, I didn't mark that one. But is that one of her famous? Yeah, I would say so. I think it is. I would say it was one that was maybe noteworthy when this book first came out. And I feel like now that I have your face by heart, it's something that I recognize as like a known line, a fairly well-known line. But it also could be that I read it a bunch of times yeah. because it is said a bunch of times in this poem. <laughs> Yeah, the last poems that I would be interested. I mean, what are the last ones that? Um, I didn't really mark any in the last one. There was a few things I highlighted in March Twilight, but. March Twilight, I love. Yeah. March Twilight might be one of my favorite poems. Period, and it's again one that I like always go back to to try to unpack again march twilight we have this we there's a lot of twilight a lot of march <laughs> there's a lot of month and season and time of day i think typically as references to times of one life's times of one's life not just as moments in nature this light is a lot is lost backward 
delight by hurt and by bias gained, nothing we know about and all that we shan't have. It is the light with which presages to the loser luck and cowardice to the brave. The hour when the oldest and the newest thoughts begin, light shed for the most desperate and kindest embrace. A watcher in these new late beams might well see another face and look into time's eye as into a strange house for what lies within. Yeah, the first thing I highlighted was just this This light is lost backward. That was just good. I just marked it. And yeah, this thing with time, time's eye. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a lot of play on just like twi- the idea of twilight right. and semi dark and, you know, the sun being below the horizon. Right? Lost backward. <laughs> Right. I feel like I'm always untwisting what loss backward means. Yeah. Maybe describe it. You know, that, I feel like that's. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but how do you lose something backward? When the light goes down, I guess it depends which way you're facing. So you could think of it literally in the sense of at twilight. One side the sun is right; it's dark, and the other side is it's growing or going down. Still light. My most experience was that was driving uh, through Kansas in the winter time, and I was on the highway, and it was like it was going down. It was like twilight, kind of, and like the sun was going down, and you could literally see behind you like darkness, and in front of you like the steadiness, like the sun. Could be that. Yeah. And there's just a lot of sort of, I fucking hate saying this word. There's a lot of like the juxtaposition between new and late. Right. The oldest and the newest thoughts begin. A watcher in these new late beams. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. I'm always going back to it. And again, I'm always like, is this, you know, are we talking about end of winter, beginning of spring? There's a lot of March, so I don't like in poems that I always think maybe, um, yeah, I don't know. A lot of March. Springtime, time changes. uh, Yeah, springtime. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, this is one of those things where I'm like almost sick of this urge to unpack poems entirely, which is fun. Like, I enjoy doing it, you know. But (sighs) the need for pure logic or to understand every instance of beauty. You mean for March Twilight? Yeah, or just poetry generally. But we argue about this plenty. How much meaning is meaning? You know? Because, I mean, like, we've both read this once years ago, right? Picked it up, read it again. Probably spent... I, I definitely spent less time with it, this reading, than my first. But... How much does understanding each poem contribute to how much you like each poem? Well, I'd say quite a lot, right? Yeah, I go back and forth on this. So not understanding what you read means what? It sometimes provokes me to reread. Right. Or sometimes it's there because something complicated is happening and I need to read it again to understand it, you know? Right. But there's a lot of Bogan I don't understand yet. Well, this is always and my enjoy thing. enjoy nonetheless. The vagueness. So a lot of poetry, there are vague references to things. And I don't think that's the issue with Bogan necessarily as... I don't know. I just find some of the things she's talking about to be more uninteresting. 
Yeah. There's a lot of abstraction in there. Yeah. Death, love, all that. I don't know. I just, yeah, like I said, my problem with this wasn't so much uh, that it was bad, because it wasn't. My problem was that I am disinterested. Well, you heard it here, guys. You heard it here first. Louise Bogan. Andrew Woodstadt. Disinterested. <sighs> not interested. God, I'm so bored. Right, yeah. That's what I mean. <laughs> well, it's just hard, you know? But is it? Like, that's my whole... Like, is it that hard to not be bored? Like, I don't... I usually don't find it that difficult to... I don't know. I mean, I did latch on to what I thought was good in this, like I did. Mark does go back to those. These, are, I think, are largely, like, they're, you know, I mean, we talked about how there's a bitchiness, but there's also, like, this pretty quiet quality to a lot of it. What do you mean? Uh, like... They don't feel highly performative. They don't feel like they do a lot of exclamation. They don't feel especially boisterous or bouncy. I mean, that's not to say they aren't like in any way playful. But there is like a refined quietness so and i think you know theme can contribute to that too where you have a lot of nature and a lot of concern with time and a lot of concern with stillness and things that you know don't change yeah the blue estuaries yeah I mean, she was writing at a time where, you know, the big poets could still read your book and say, you know, they're not all that good. But there are some good nuggets in here. And I think that's true. And essentially, that's what Rithke said of her poems, and that's someone she ended up having an affair with. Yeah, I think that's true for everyone, though. Like, I mean, they're not all good, yeah. Yeah, it's true of every poet true of every writer probably I mean it is Charles says true of every artist some stinkers anyway welcome to the most boring episode of heavy board yeah it was pretty bored heavy and bored yeah and I, and I had the least amount of notes on this as well and yeah being the second time I read it like I said in the beginning is I kind of feel the exact same way I felt about it reading it like six years ago seven years ago which is just yeah i maintain that i i became more and more invested in it as i went on but you know do you don't have as much time to commit to just reading or i don't and i feel like a lot of my reading for this was concerned with just untwisting what was being said and I only succeeded at that in very few places. And it's not always going to be a clear, this is what, you know, this poem means, right? Like, we talk about that. There's a sense of, like, what this poem is about and the attitude toward that thing. And specific phrasings will, you know, mean something very specific and change how you read the poem. But there isn't always a clear one sentence. This is what this means. Yeah. Blue estuaries. Ah! Anything else? Or are we done? Not unless you want to... Uh... If you want to read the very last poem. It's a shorty. Part of this. I don't have any notes on it. Wait, me neither. It's part of those three songs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I always forget that. So you see the last part and you're like, that's fun. 
And I always forget because I don't like this first song. I always go, ugh. I don't really like that. I don't like the second one very much either. Psychiatrist song. I th- yeah, I mean, fuck it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I guess we don't have to go into that. Unless yeah. Want to. I mean, we could talk about Night. Night? Night is the title poem. Oh. The cold remote islands and the blue estuaries. Where what breathes, breathes the restless wind of the inlets. And what drinks, drinks the incoming tide. Where shell and weed wait upon the salt wash of the sea. And the clear nights of stars swing their lights westward to set behind the land. Where the pulse clinging to the rocks renews itself forever. Where again on cloudless nights the water reflects the firmament's partial setting. O oh, remember in your narrowing dark hours that more things move than blood in the heart. I mean, yeah, that could be the thesis of this whole book. Oh, remember. <laughs> in your narrowing dark hours. I can see why this was the title poem, even though I'm not usually a fan of poems that are so listy. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. works. Like, all her stuff. Or it's... what breathes, breathes. Where shell and weed. Where the pulse clinging to the rocks. Where again on cloudless nights. You know, very listy, but it's fine. <clears throat> well, I like where, it. It's a good poem. Well, that's where I get to taste because I'm just like, look, like there's nothing wrong with these poems. Like there's nothing I can point <laughs> to that can be very much like, oh, well, it's not working because of this. Like they all work. I'm just not that. I'm just not interested. Yeah. And I'll say this, I agree with you, that as you got, as you move along in this, it does get better. Like, you get more invested, and I think, especially in the section four onward, where you start to see her searching for something artistic, like, breaking the rules more, all of that. Yeah, I mean, more and she's a poem that you really have to dig into, like, Emily Dickinson, like, you have to spend a lot of time you know, unpacking these super compressed poems. Yeah, my problem is, is like when you start to unpack them, there, I mean, there are a lot, but like there isn't that much. Not always, but there, yeah. yeah. Some of them are right on point. Night is right on point. I think you're right. They mature over time, but yeah, some is hard. Some of them are hard to see. And like, I don't always mind that again like i don't always require like a a perfect aligning of all the meanings in a poem i think that's okay but i do think that it can become a frustration to readers it can become tiring to readers etc that's where you start to lose steam in poetry. You have to be able to look up every now and again and just have like a fun poem, you know? Like not every not everything has to be quite so dense. Yeah, but again, I think density isn't so much my problem as it is just boring. Yeah, I get that. I think she was such a master of sound that I didn't feel especially bored. But there were moments where I was like, uh I could skip this poem, right. and no one would know. All right. Anything else on this? Did we cover it all? Oh, I mean, I like Bogan. Now I just am sort of thinking of, uh, you know, because you see most pictures of Bogan, and you so- see most pictures of Ted Rithke. You just think of their bodies slapping together. <laughs> yeah, when you think of the couples fucking... Oh. Sweaty slaps. Yeah, it's good shit. Yeah. Flapping. Hanging. Yeah, I'm sure they both smoked. Hair. Hairy. 
The hair. The hairy, sweaty gut just flopping. Oh. <laughs> Looking gross. <laughs> well, all right. All right. So, a reminder to listeners, uh, you can reach us at heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, subscribe to our Patreon. Receive full uncensored episodes for subscribers. Uh, check out our YouTube channels. Uh, links to everything that we uh, talked about here in the books in the description, as well as next week's book, which we're doing, um, To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. We'll link that in the description as well. Uh, and our final reminder, we're looking for workshop horror stories. So if you have a workshop horror story, uh, we want to hear from you. Send it to heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, that should be fun. And this has been Heavy Board. My name is Andrew Woodstock. I'm Sophie Wiener. I guess that's it. Bye. I am heavy, heavy, heavy board. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.